Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Cochran, the CEO and Executive Director of the United States Conference of Mayors, and I would like to welcome you uh, to this National Plesco Forum celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. It seems like only yesterday, when you look back in the 70s, with the mayors of this nation working with uh, Senator Muskie to pass this act, that was the time when I was a young boy and I had black hair. <laughs> and later we created, we helped create the EPA with uh, President Nixon. And so it was, a, it, was a, it was a very, very, very significant time for our country and for the environmental health of our country. And this, m this legislation that was passed 40 years ago set this country on a course of environmental responsibility that any other, no other law in our, as it was in our history. The Clean Water Act paved the way to protect our citizens from disease, our environment from destruction, and it fuels our economy. It was a great thing, and it still is. And yet, when you have changes and transformations as significant as this act does, there are challenges. We're here today to celebrate this legislation. We're here today to celebrate this country and this government for recognizing what, is, what we need in the environmental nature. One only has to go to East Berlin <coughs> and places like that and see the ravages of what happens to cities when there is no there is no central government assistance in this matter. So as mayors and as cities, you know, it's all about us to make the changes. And so we're here today uh, to talk about some of the challenges that mayors are facing for 40 years after the Clean Water Act. First of all, uh, if you travel uh, outside the United States, uh, they used to say, if you're going to Mexico, make sure it's rum and Coca-Cola. In the United States of America, you can drink out of the tap. Believe me, it's the cleanest water on earth. When you go to Russia, like I was uh, two weeks ago, you know, you always ask that question, is it okay if I brush my teeth? Can I take a shower? And when you go to China, they, you know, they would say, our water is the cleanest. But when you look at the Chinese mayors, they're drinking bottled water. So let's understand something right now. We're very proud of the fact that the United States drinking water is among the safest in, in the world. And our governments, our city governments, have made huge investments to achieve clean water goals. But the successes in addition to clean water is waterborne diseases, typhoid, cholera. They cause sickness and they cause death and they have been nearly eradicated. Limiting water and wastewater rates to affordable levels has fueled growth in the American economy. Because if your rates go down, you can have money to spend somewhere else. It's that simple. Our lakes and our rivers have improved tremendously since the 1960s. It seems only yesterday when Randy Newman wrote that song about the river that was burning in Cleveland. Today, our rivers are no longer burning. Today, we have com commercial fisheries on our rivers and they are on the rise. And there's still, still much to be done to protect our water resources. And the rising cost of doing those things bring us to a fiscal crossroads with affordability. It is more important than ever to ensure that our investments produce the greatest public benefits. And that's why we're here today. Many mayors have registered concern over the financial impact the EPA is having by prosecuting cities because of sewer overflows during rain events. Let me give you a figure. Just like in public safety, the cities of America spend billions of dollars for police officers. If you don't have a safe city, as Mayor Wellington Webb of Denver said, you don't have a city. 
just as we spend th billions of dollars to protect this nation, you know, local governments spend $103 billion. This is no federal money, this is no state money. $103 billion on water and wastewater in 2009. This is up from $50 billion in 1995. So you can see what's happening there. Each year our cities are spending more just to keep up with Washington, who continually to issue new proclamations that add more and more costs on cities with little financial help. Let's consider just one of the uh, mandates. This is sort of one of the costly mandates, and that's combined sewage overflows, CSO. Now, uh, for those persons that don't understand what CSO is, believe me, at the United States Conference of Mayors, we do, because over the past four years, and by the way, let me just say this, this does not start with the Obama administration. It started many, many years ago with Carol Brown the Clinton administration, the Bush administration. So this just didn't sh jump up here uh, when President Obama was elected. But it is still a problem. And so the, the, the combined sewer overflow, at the time it was designed, combined sewers were considered a very good technology because it's very basic. It prevents raw sewage from backing up into your house. Combined sewers, like the name suggests, combine sewer and stormwater systems. Together, these waters are sent to a wastewater treatment plant where it is treated and released into a lake and river. However, when there's significant rain, you know what rain is? We have no control over rain. We have no control over traffic. We have no control over rain, but it rains. And so when there's significant rain, it overwhelms the pipes and there was a safety valve included. It prevented the sewage from backing up into residences. So um, the, the, the issue is we had, we had safety valves, and so instead of releasing these into a water body, we, re, we, we resulted in situations where there were some beach closings and some ball water alerts. For years, for years, the only way to fix the CSO problem was to build new sewer lines under the city or build giant holding facilities or tunnels for the wastewater. The cost of these solutions are staggering, absolutely staggering and they rely on energy intensive pumping and costly, quote, gray environmental designs, infrastructure designs. For example, the cost of Washington, D.C. is $2.6 billion. The cost of Indianapolis is $3.1 billion. The cost of Atlanta, Georgia is $4.1 billion. The cost of o Omaha, Nebraska is $1.7 the cost to St. Louis is 4.7. Let me remind everybody in the urban world, there's $3.8 billion a year in a community development block grant. And the CSO for St. Louis, Missouri is $4.7 billion. This is just the cost of one mandate, one mandate. So we've heard uh, about this from our mayors and we are trying to uh, talk to the EPA, and we are very happy that we are working with the Obama administration. We are working with the EPA administrator and others to come up with something that's been termed in what we're calling an integrated uh, plan, uh, planning policy. Integrating planning policy. There have been five workshops throughout America. My staff have been there, mayors have been there. We are, we are trying to put a framework on this baby called the Integrated Planning Policy, which is something that we negotiated and we want. So after arraying all of these factors, they would consider a city's proposal, and the key word here is flexibility. In other words, the Obama administration, EPA, will work with the city to make it as flexible as possible. Unfortunately, we have not seen the Integrated Planning Policy. Uh, it was promised uh, you know, two months ago, and we're still waiting. So we are looking forward to that. We understand and we believe that uh, the, administ the administration is working with some cities for the implementation, but we wanna make sure that we, as we move forward and we work on this new plan, that we do not get more decrees and more mandates and more rules. So I think what we're asking today, in addition to some other issues, is we just put an abeyance on any new rules 
until we can work together on the integrated planning policy. We are now 40, after 40 years at the point where Congress is looking at this legislation. They are threatening to uh, change legislation. They're calling us to the Hill, wanting us to join with them to change the legislation. And we're concerned about this. It's the political environment that we're in. And so that's why we're working uh, very hard with the Obama administration and the EPA. But here's something for certain, and you need to understand this. We, in the greatest recession since the Great Depression, we cannot afford to pay for a continuing cascade of water mandates. And that's why we're here today. So now let's hear from the mayors. I'd like for each of them to identify themselves and to tell you about their city's experience. Let me say that there are many, many mayors, including my president, Mayor Antonio Villarosa <coughs> of Los Angeles, including my vice president, uh, Mayor Michael Nutter, including the chair of our water council, uh, Rollins Blake of Baltimore. There are many, many cities who are working with EPA. Many, many cities. There are a select number of cities. We want all cities to be working with EPA. We want all cities to be recognized so that we can work together to make this a situation that will work in today's economy and at the same time protect the environment of this nation. So at this point, I would like to call on each mayor to, to uh, talk about his or her situation. Uh, I would like first to call on Mayor Ron Littlefield of Chattanooga. Uh, mayor Littlefield. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cocker and I am Ron Littlefield. I'm the mayor of the city of Chattanooga, which is a mid-sized city, uh, presently with a population of around 170,000 in the city and about a half a million in the immediate metropolitan area. It actually extends across the line into Georgia. So we're a river city, and uh, we have an industrial history and heritage, which is fairly unique in the South. You don't find a lot of industrial-based cities, but if you look back at old pictures of Chattanooga from the Civil War and immediately thereafter, or, or pen and ink drawings or whatever, one feature always stood out, and that was smokestacks. And they were so proud of it at the time that if they weren't billowing smoke, they actually drew it in so that people would know this is a, a heavily industrialized city. What you couldn't see, in addition to the smokestacks, were the sewers. We had combined sewers. We still have combined sewers, principally in the older part of the city, in the downtown area. Some of them are brick. We have worked on them over the years. They're, they're lined. We keep them in as good a shape as we can. But just as Mr. Cochran said, replacing that particular part of our infrastructure is really not financially or even physically feasible just because of the way the city was built. In 1969, Walter Cronkite, who is very prominent on the wall right outside this door, told the world that the dirtiest city in America was Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was not a Chamber of Commerce moment for us. <laughs> he was talking particularly about air pollution, which was pretty easy to see if you visited there. But what you couldn't see, or you didn't normally see, was below Chattanooga on the Tennessee River, little signs along the river that said avoid human contact. Because industrial pollution is not just air pollution, it's water pollution as well. Well, we started on these problems before there was an Environmental Protection Agency. We were a city that knew that we had to deal with this, that, uh, that people, the quality of life was important to the whole population. And so we made headway and we still uh, benefit from the fact that we were there on this issue before EPA showed up on the scene. We work with EPA, we respect EPA, we know our EPA and our state environmental people very well on a first name basis and we will continue to do that. With that, let me say that we are this close to a new consent order, which we've worked on for about two years. So I'm not here to criticize those that have worked on that process. We're now a city that is clean and green. We're featured almost every week in some superlative list, which we're very proud of. If you came to Chattanooga today, you would not recognize it as a city that had that kind of a dirty history, but we are. We're all in favor of environmental quality. I think that should actually go without saying. We are cities that represent people, children, 
And for that reason, we cannot shirk or ignore that responsibility. But since the 1970s, cities have been shouldering most of this responsibility. So the question that we have yet to deal with is how do we finish the job? And that's really what we're looking at, finishing the job. And then the big problem, how do we pay for it? Uh, Mayor Lowfield, can you just make a brief comment on your recall situation <coughs> and how it relates to some of these mandates? Well, I was, uh, along with um, Mayor Berger, was on one of these panels a few months ago uh, having to do this with... This is a very political issue that the mayors have to live with when these mandates are passed down from right. in Washington. Well, uh, you, you, you t people tend to not be happy, and in this Tea Party-fueled environment that we have today, when you raise rates even for necessities like water quality, and that's really what we have done in Chattanooga. We raised rates, uh, we raised taxes, and we, most inflammatory, raised stormwater fees, which people love to refer to as rain taxes. But you have to clean the water and there's a cost associated with it. And for that, I was rewarded with a, um, a recall movement fueled primarily by the Tea Party, which is still ongoing, I might add. I have about 10 months left in office, but they're still trying to recall me. But uh, you cannot expect this to be a, a process that's without political bumps. And uh, the fact that cities and city mayors have to step up and do it is something that we would like to see recognized on the national level. Uh, and uh, let me ask you this, uh, Mayor, what does the uh, sort of the physical uh, geography, how does that play uh, such a unique role, uh, role for the city of, Ch of Chattanooga when you're looking at your CSO plan? Chattanooga is a, is a river city. The Tennessee River actually bisects our downtown area. The Tennessee River is about the fifth largest river, most significant river in the United States. It is the heart of the Tennessee Valley, the Tennessee Valley Authority of all of that fame. And uh, we are at the bottom of the bowl. We're a city of about 150 square miles, which is fairly large geographically. We're actually just a little bit larger than Atlanta, if you look at the uh, geography. But the area that is drained is much larger than that. And so everything that bubbles out of the ground or gets contaminated out there in the drainage area flows into Chattanooga. We uh, have the, the responsibility of, before it actually leaves Chattanooga, of making sure that it's clean. And so one of my big problems with, uh, with the way that we have been going about this process of cleaning up the water is the fact that by hammering away on cities, and Chattanooga's not unique, there are a lot of river cities. I mean, that was normally the place you would put a city. If there was a river around, you put it at the low point because it was easy to drain everything there. It was the heart of, of commerce, usually. But uh, by hammering away on cities and ignoring those that are out in the outlying areas, EPA is doing something that I don't think they intend to do, but it is a byproduct, it is an effect, and that is they are encouraging sprawl. I've been very offended and upset many, many times in the years that I've been in government when public officials outside of Chattanooga basically sold themselves of, you can move out here. You can move beyond that, that invisible line, which is the city limit, and therefore you won't have to pay those stormwater fees. Your, your cost of doing business is lower. The effect of that is we don't have a, a densifying, efficient city uh, as we could have because EPA and their the way that they are imposing the regulations are actually promoting sprawl. Thank you. Uh, next we have uh, Mayor Dave Berger for Limer, Ohio. <coughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, thanks for properly pronouncing our name. Um, it's good to be here today. Um, Lima is a community in northwest Ohio. We're a, a proud community, but we're a community of modest financial means. We're a city that has shrunk from roughly 52,000 to 38,000 over the last uh, three decades as more affluent households move to the suburbs. In the last 10 years, in order to balance our budget, we have shrunk our workforce from 530 to 350. I no longer have a chief of staff. I haven't had a secretary for 13 years. We know how to manage 
in order to balance our budget. We do without. Our annual household median income is roughly $30,500. Ohio's, by comparison, is $47,000, and the national median household income is $52,000. $30,000 versus $52,000 on a national basis. Nearly one-third of my community is living under the poverty threshold of $22,000. Additionally, our demographic profile includes aging baby boomers that comprise a substantial and growing class of fixed income seniors. Our low moderate and fixed income households are particularly vulnerable to the increasing costs of basic services like water, sewer, and stormwater fees. Having said that, however, since the passage of the Clean Water Act, the City of Lima has spent 60, nearly $60 million on capital improvements uh, for our sewer system, with $25 million of that coming initially from the federal government as a grant, something that does not exist in this current day of federal mandates. As a result of our expenditures, we have substantially improved the water quality in the Ottawa River, which cuts through the middle of our city. An improvement in which now 65% of the river is in full attainment for warm water habitat status, and 35% is in partial attainment. Before the Clean Water Act, 60% of the river was in non-attainment. 60% in non-attainment versus 65% in full attainment today. Now no portion of the river is in non-attainment. We're proud of what we have accomplished. But we are very concerned about what is now and what has been demanded of us over the last decade by US EPA. And I'd like to give you a history of our, what's called the long-term control plan. The city submitted our plan in 1998 to the state, which has primacy in this matter. Ohio EPA reviewed that and one year later approved the plan to which we were committed in spending another $60 million. Four years later in 2005, US EPA, four years after approval, interceded and rejected the long-term control plan. Since then, Lima has spent another $6 million on attorneys and engineers, and we haven't cleaned another damn drop of water. US EPA is attempting to force us into a consent decree that would entail $104 million in capital costs, which for our households in poverty would represent a sewer bill that would range between 4 to 7% of their household income. Think about spending 7% of your household income on a sewer bill. No one can argue that this is not unreasonable. No one can argue that this is not a matter of economic injustice. I have made it clear that I will not take forward any plan that my community cannot afford. Furthermore, I have also made it clear that I will not take and accept any financial penalties as a part of any settlement with the federal government. They may treat us like criminals, but I will not accept that status. Last year, Mayor Suttle and I co-authored a resolution for consideration by the membership of the Conference of Mayors. It's called Resolution 43. We asked Congress for one of two things. Either give us at least 50% of the funding for the mandates that you have created, or give us relief. Relief needs to be specific. Relief needs to define the out outer limits of the discretion of the agency. Compliance schedules, keep in mind, we're 40 years after the Clean Water Act. Compliance schedules that are being dictated to us now are no more than 20 years. We're asking that compliance schedules be at least 30, perhaps as long as 50 years. The opportunity to incorporate green infrastructure in substantive ways to offset gray infrastructure 
and the heavy capital costs associated with that. We've asked for a focus on achieving real water quality improvements rather than a compliance schedule with an arbitrary number of four overflow events a year regardless of the receiving stream. Affordability ultimately needs to be defined as no more than 2% of median household income. 2% should not be the floor, it needs to be the ceiling for costs that are being imposed by all of these water-related mandates. Unfortunately, frankly, we have not seen any substantive action by Congress on our request. <clears throat> We're still waiting. By the way, I'm a registered Democrat in a nonpartisan office. Mayor, um, the grants that you mentioned that we don't have, we did have these grants. Uh, we lost them uh, during the Reagan administration. We lost $23 billion uh, with that administration. And um, those grants, we remember those grants fondly and wish we still had them. Um, let me ask you this, Mayor. You are very uh, stern in your opinion about where you are, and uh, you know, and I understand that. And of course, we have heard also from our uh, distinguished former president, Mayor Don uh, Pasquelic of Akron in Ohio. So, you know, when he's in the room, we hear too. So, uh, but the question uh, I would ask you is we have this integrated uh, planning policy that's on the table. Uh, how do you, I mean, and we're very, there are many, many mayors that are excited about this. Uh, what would be your recommendations to the government or relative to the fact they are coming forth with this flexible uh, policy? Well, first of all, we have formally uh, requested to be able to uh, file an integrated plan, and we have our attorneys and engineers actively working on that. So we see it as an opportunity. But it's also become clear, in because I've participated in the five, at least one of the five, uh, meetings around the country that you referenced earlier, that there are limits to what the agency believes the integrated plan can accomplish. Um, and I think that, for example, uh, they continue to argue that the preferred vehicle for accomplishing this is a consent decree. Uh, they believe and they argue that um, they're doing us a favor. They're doing us a favor by putting us into consent decrees because it protects us from citizen lawsuits. Mm -hmm. My perspective, and I think the perspective of many, is that the preferred way to regulate this is through permits. If we can't get to uh, that way of regulating, we shouldn't be in the business of taking us into court and treating us like criminals. This becomes a hostile, uh, dictatorial process that is heavy-handed. You know, recently there was a comment uh, public, publicized by the Region 9 administrator who said very clearly, uh, cities need to be crucified. They need to be made an example of. I know that that gentleman was relieved of his responsibilities and the agency has spun it that that's the exception. I can tell you that after many conversations with many mayors, it's not the exception. We, do, we find ourselves under a heavy cudgel, and the approach of the Department of Justice and US EPA in this is not about stewardship. It's not about the kind of partnership that ought to exist between local governments, the states, and the federal government. So, I mean, we, we, we learned in the Brownfields movement back in the 80s that we had states like New Jersey and Illinois that were stepping up to the plate and saying, hey, Let's do this, but yet we had uh, Carol Brown at EPA raising questions about that. We worked with her very, very carefully, and uh, I think we made uh, progress there on the brownfield development. It, it seems to me when you're a mayor, uh, you're dealing with three entities. You're dealing with the regional EPA, you're dealing with the state EPA, and you're dealing with the federal EPA. Is that a fair statement? It is, and they don't, they're not all on the same page. Right. I um, mean, in our instance, for example, um, the region fired the state. They kept them out of our discussions for most of the time of our negotiations, and we had to insist six months ago that the state need to be brought back in. That's um, a hell of a note when uh, mayors want the governors to come in and help them. 
That's true. I just want to make that observation. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we fought a war about that, I think. Okay, uh, let's move on. Thank you so much, Mayor Sutton from Omaha. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to uh, set a little bit of a foundation for my credentials. I am a civil engineer. I'm a former public works director for the city of Omaha back in the 1980s. My entire career, I've had projects all across this great nation as well as some around the globe. And in every one of those, we had environmental issues that had to be solved with engineering before we could move on to the main task at hand. This gives me a very unique perspective as mayor to begin addressing this issue of the CSO not only from Omaha's standpoint, but in, in concert with my colleagues with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. The unfunded federal mandate is one of the biggest issues that are going to be facing Omaha and all other cities. And it boils down to one single word of concern, affordability, affordability. It's no secret that cities are under stress and have been for considerable uh, months and years with this recession. What's going on is the states are slashing uh, their budgets. They're pushing the problems down to the cities. The cities now have to figure out how to solve increased burdens and responsibilities, but the cash flow is not there to sustain these. And in the middle of this, we're addressing CSO in some 772 jurisdictions, <coughs> most of which are, are cities. Rather than asking cities to bear this burden along, alone, I think the federal government should be looking at a collaboration. And if we're going to call it a partnership, which I would love to start calling it that, we need to have this on two fronts. The technical solutions need to be a partnership working together, and the financial solutions need to be a partnership working together. We need to shift our thinking from where the local, state, and federal officials are practicing their leadership. We need to shift that thinking to working together in, in a true sense of commonality as we address the Clean Water Act and the environmental issues and the spending priorities that are facing all of us. More particularly, we owe it to our constituents now, cities have um, the voters, but we also, when we serve as a utility, when it comes to the sewer side, we are serving the users of that particular sewer system. And we have a responsibility to both those groups, even though they may be uh, one and the same. In my case, they are not, because I have a regional system that touches three counties, and that includes <laughs> Douglas, Sarpy County, and Nebraska, and Pottawatomie County in Iowa because Carter Lake for some reason ended up on the west side of the Missouri River. <laughs> the partnership that we need must have a 50-50 split between the federal and the local governments on the financials and we must have an end to the consent decrees and switch it to a permitting process. Given the current state of our economy and the high unemployment that many jurisdictions are confronting. We need to face this affordability question uh, straight on. And if we don't, we're going to have a rebellion. And it's already started in my community 18 months ago with my 11 heavy industries. It's now creeping into 13,000 commercial users. And next it's going to be the residentials, because every time a bill goes out, we get increased complaints in my office on the hotline. We need somehow to get a grants program in place at the federal level so we can exercise this 50-50 partnership and begin to really, really address the financial issue. The, well, my, excuse me. Go ahead. The uh, consent order that we have signed is administrative. We worked hard to keep it administrative for a reason, because it gives us the flexibility to work with our state in finding enhancements. And if any of you want to see the enhancement strategies that I have put in place last January, there's a handout right here. You're welcome to take <coughs> one and uh, see how, what we are, are proposing. Yesterday, we received a verbal notice from our state that we are going to get a three-year extension 
to the year uh, 2027 because of the uh, catastrophic nature of this Missouri River flood of last year that lasted for 104 days and caused us to expend $31 million on budgeted in order to protect our city and also Carter Lake. This is great that gives us some time here to let us work through the problems of the present uh, flood situation, but get back on plan uh, as soon as we get through this. We believe that the reduced cost of our combined sewer overflow needs to be addressed through new technology and green technology. So you put those two in play, you're going to begin working toward this affordability answer. We believe that this is a very, very important step. What's more troubling that we find is that we're required to provide the safe wastewater system using models from the past at a time when we need to be using models of the future. Everyone else is, why aren't we doing it here? And a perfect example is this smartphone that is going to be out of date in another 12 months and we'll move on to something new. <laughs> we need to be doing this and what we're doing with our clean water mandates. This flexibility needs to be included with every jurisdiction and why we need to switch from consent decrees that lawyers have crafted to permitting processes that engineers are working on to find solutions together. If we don't do this, cities like Omaha are going to be faced with horrific debt. We not only will have this, this debt at the national level, but we will start seeing it at the local level, and this is not carrying our country in the right uh, direction. With that, I'm going to close, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and discuss this subject with you. Mr. Mayor, I just want to make a note. I was up in Philadelphia yesterday with Mayor Nutter, and uh, he is using the green technology to get credits and work with EPA, and so we, maybe you, we need to look at Philadelphia for you to consider also. Uh, I'm, I, I'm interested to, uh, when you, once you get the cost uh, uh, that, that, that comes to you, I'm interested uh, to, uh, how do you allocate the mandate to your citizens, and also uh, your, your businesses, uh, large and small, and, and uh, I mean, is there a political process for that, or do you just put something in a newspaper? Uh, how, how does that work? Well, we're no different than anyone else. By state law and federal law, when we put on the hat of the uh, sewer utility, we have to have a independent rate consultant assess our cost with capital and operating over an extended period of time, and that has to be converted back in by some type of a rational formula that's fair to the residential, to the commercial, and to the industry. We can't just pull numbers out of the air, and that's the dilemma I'm facing right now as we're trying to work with our chamber and others. They do not understand that this is a utility and must be treated as such. Thank you. And uh, next we have the Mayor Chickapee, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Michael Bissonette, who is also the Vice Chair of our Environmental Committee. Thank you, Mr. Cochran, and good morning, everybody. Let's be clear about one thing. No one is looking to turn back the clock. What we're here today, and I think Mr. Cochran used the right word, is to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And I think to use an old Southern saying that uh, Mayor Hellendale probably knows a little bit too well, is that when you're up to your tail in alligators, it's hard to remember the objective was to drain the swamp. The good news is we've almost drained the swamp. The bad news is, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, we have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars more to get that last 5% of draining. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Chicopee. Uh, I represent a city in the western part of the state, second largest city uh, west of 495. Uh, we have a community of about 56,000 people. Uh, your Wall Street Journal that you read today was published there. The Callaway golf balls that some of you may have lost last weekend were made there. And uh, Westover Air Reserve Base uh, is the largest reserve base in the country. Uh, we have a long history of being part of what once famously was called the best landscape sewer 
in America. That's the Connecticut River, which flows from northern New England down through Hamden County and into Long Island Sound. As a boy, I played baseball on a field next to the Connecticut River, where we saw all kinds of things floating down that river, a lot of which was human waste, raw sewage. The river would turn a variety of colors based on the chemicals that manufacturers were back then dumping willy-nilly right directly into the river. Before I left Chickabee yesterday, I saw people in the river fishing for shad. People are boating, they're recreating. And so that's something worth celebrating. We are getting people back to the riverfronts. Uh, I often tell people that with the confluence of the Chickabee River in the Connecticut in Chickabee, Massachusetts, my community has more waterfront than most places on Cape Cod. And it's true. But at the same time, this is not 1972 anymore. And so we're asking as part of the celebration of, of the success of the Clean Water Act, the success of the EPA, that we stop, that we call a timeout, that we call for a moratorium, and take a look at where we've been, how far we've come, and what we really need, need to do to get to that last mile. Right now, under a court-ordered consent decree, the city of Chicopee has expended $125 million. We are out to bid on our latest phased project to replace the combined sewer overflows and separate the pipes. That $125 million is going to be a debt on the backs of our ratepayers till the year 2045. The additional $75 million that's necessary to complete the projects listed in the mandate will have our ratepayers paying for those till 2075, 30 years of additional borrowing. Now, the rates to pay this all off have gone up 337 percent since 2003. So you wonder why mayors are facing recalls. You're wondering why there's populist uprisings. It's happening because these rates and these kinds of improvements are simply unsustainable in both the short term and the long term. We certainly need more time to implement them. We certainly need a contribution from the federal government to, to implement them. And I have to tell you, right now, uh, we're paying three times as much in debt service for borrowing as I am for the entire municipal debt. And that's with two brand new high schools, a brand new fire station, and a brand new library. We need a senior center and a new police station. But it's not some abstract group of people that are paying the sewer bills and the water bills. It's the same taxpayers that are paying for the police station and the senior center and the library and the two high schools. So we need a bit of a time out. And this is really, I think, the time for us to all be celebrating and saying, you know, look how far we've come. Kids today playing on the Connecticut River don't have to see a stream of different colors. They don't have to see raw sewage floating. What they get to see is something that they and their families and their grandkids can enjoy for generations to come. But we're putting too big a burden on the ratepayers, and we are looking for some time, some money, and some relief. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for your positive statements as well as the challenges. And finally, I'd like to call on the Conference of Mayor's Environmental Chair, Mayor George Cooper of Hallandale Beach, Florida. Now, Mayor Cooper, unlike the other mayors here, uh, she does not have the major CSO issue, but you would you have other water and wastewater issues to deal with, and would you mind just uh, briefly talking about that? Sure. Th thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you all for being here and giving us the opportunity to develop some awareness and, again, celebrate the successes over the past 40 years. It's an honor to be here, uh, not only representing the U.S. Conference of Mayors Environmental Committee, but, of course, my city, Hallandale <coughs> Beach, as a mayor. 
And as Tom said, uh, we're fortunate. We don't have a CSO issue, but we're facing many other issues in Florida. And I'm very, very proud uh, to be serving in a task force in Broward County on water issues. And of course, Florida itself has been on the forefront of many issues, being one of the states that is doing one of the biggest restoration programs in the country of a national treasure are Everglades. So we are constantly aware of water. We're by nature surrounded by it. We share water from underneath the ground in the Floridian aquifer and the aquifers below us. So we work collaboratively in Florida with our neighbors, with our state, and yes, the EPA. I'll tell you a little bit about um, Hallandale Beach. We're a mid-sized city, smaller city compared to others. We're 37,000 uh, population. Our median income is per capita $24,000 on average. We have about 20% of our residents living below poverty in our city. So when we talk about the fees and the costs of what it takes to provide services, in my mind as a mayor, we focus on many priorities <coughs> and our key priority is the health and well-being of our residents and how they are able to balance their pocketbooks. As a mayor, our priorities, of course, are the safety of our city, our police, our fire, and then the lifeblood of our community, our water sources, because they do impact not just our residents, they impact our commerce, particularly in South Florida. We want to make sure our beaches are pristine, that our fishermen are happy, and all our waters are, are kept pure. So with that, our city over the past 10 years has been investing in water infrastructure. One of our key concerns that we are being addressed with now is saltwater intrusion, which is by fact impacting the low-lying areas, being on a beach between Fort Lauderdale and Miami. We are looking at investing and doing studies that actually will move some of our well systems. Just last week, we've actually authored a million dollar study as a small community to see how we could place our wells further west and get our existing wells off system. With that, over the past eight years, we've invested in $15 million of infrastructure for a nano filtration plant to ensure that our water is pure. As a matter of fact, we're very, very proud. Our Florida, our ranked water was number two in the state. Number one was St. Mary's, so we felt that they had some of the uh, saint on their side, so of course. Um, but we're very, very proud of our water. And again, going back, we're independent with our water, and our residents and our businesses are paying for those investments out of their pocketbooks, and we very, very closely need to watch them. This future project is going to cost upward to $10 million dollars again, without direct assistance from the government, without direct assistance from the state, actually from everyone's pocketbook. The other issues that we've been facing with are wastewater <coughs> issues, and actually an issue that the state is working on collaboratively is with ocean outfalls in Broward County. The projections and partnership, we're part of a five city consortium that does our wastewater treatment it is upward to the projections of costing those users, including Broward County, with a population of over one million people, of course, and the city of Fort Lauderdale, almost a billion dollars to address the new nutrient criteria rulemaking that we have been fighting and partnering with the state and EPA. And I'm proud of our partnership with the EPA and proud that they have worked with the state of Florida to address these issues. The DEP of Florida is currently, as we speak, working on these rules and regulations, and we have been given a timeline to address them. Our portion of it alone in the city is over $15 million, which could equate to our end utility users of up to $100 a month. I'm going to say that again. $100 a month on their water bills. As a mother of three wonderful children, I know that we need to make these changes to protect our environment. But we also have to look at the families in a city like mine where the students are 
on free or assisted lunches, how are they going to be afforded these mandates? I'm very, very pleased that the EPA has met with us, is working with us, and as my mayors have said, they have come to the table. And I love what uh, Mayor Bissnett said. We do need a timeout. We need a timeout to celebrate. We also need a timeout to address green infrastructure, gray infrastructure, and the true costs. One of the first meetings with the EPA, I looked across the table and said, we are not ABC Chemical. We are governments. We share the same goals and the objective of clean water and the same goals of protecting the same constituents' pocketbook. So we're pleased with the partnership. We're just very, very anxious to get something. We have to balance our budget every year. I don't think one of our mayors said that, but we do. We have to run a balanced budget. We have to have accountability. We are accountable, but we also need consistency and flexibility. We can't have one more unfunded mandate in this economy to break the backs of our budget because we do have to pay for it. Our residents have to pay for it. So thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you all thank for you, listening mayors. us today. Let me just also mention again that um, it, there are many cities that are not here today, but there are many cities that are going to be expressing uh, their relationship uh, on the 40th anniversary of the Clean Water Act and the progress they're making with EPA. I mentioned our president, Mayor Villaraigosa, I've also mentioned our vice president, uh, Mayor Nutter, and also Mayor Rollins Blake of Baltimore, uh, who is the uh, co-chair of our Water Council. In addition, Seattle, Indianapolis, St. Louis, Cleveland, Kansas City, and Baltimore uh, are cities that we must mention that are engaged uh, in a, this process as we as we try to understand and accept and look forward to, and that's called the integrated uh, planning policy. So with that, I'd like to open the floor up now for questions to the mayors. Uh, if you would uh, identify yourself, I would appreciate it very much. For any questions? Yes. Uh, I'm John Hilton with SIEPA. Um, I've heard, it seems like there's three different things that are kind of being asked for either from EPA or from Congress. On the one hand, I'm hearing you're asking for a timeout. Either I, I assume it's a timeout for new regulations or a timeout for going forward with consent decrees. Some clarity on that would be good. But you're also here you're asking for more grant money to comply with these rules. And then also asking Congress maybe to uh, put firm limits on what EPA can do in this realm. Are those things all together, or are they different things? Or well, it's a, it's a it's a world of moving parts. Right. <clears throat> but uh, there was a time when there was a national policy, as there is in Russia, as there is in Germany, as there is in Japan, as there is in Brazil, that the nation should have clean water, and therefore the nation has decreed it should have clean water, and that's for the central government pays for it just as they do mass transit, highways, and infrastructure. In our world, we have to fight for it. We have to fight for clean water. We have to fight for it. For it. And we fought for it in 72, and by God, we're glad we got it. We're not complaining about that. Now, it's not our fault that the Congress has decided to cut us loose and let us drift. And so we think in any uh, industrial society, there should be a national metropolitan urban policy on clean water and restore those grants that were cut from us in the Reagan revolution. We lost $23 billion uh, with the uh, Reagan administration. It was not, it's not being restored. So that is another discussion with Congress. And if you are inside EPA or with the U.S. News and World Report or, or Fox News or anything, you, I can tell you right now, the chances of, of us getting additional grants for clean water with this Congress is doubtful as we speak. Now, this is, this is what we ha we're dealing with. In fact, we can't even get a meeting with the Speaker of the House to discuss these matters, which is another issue. So our relationship right now with Congress, while, while we have been pushing hard for a transportation bill, um, is, is challenged. So I'll, I'll just speak to that as a Washington, quote, lobbyist and a person that runs this organization. As for the other ask, I heard the mayor of Chicopee <coughs> say he would like a pause. And will you elaborate on that? 
be glad to. Um, the, the kind of moratorium that we're talking about involves both revisioning the consent decrees that are already in place in terms of the timetables uh, for implementation. In addition, it would be a moratorium on new regulations. And I'll give you one good example. There are currently regulations that are being promulgated for nutrient removal standards uh, for fresh waters. Now, there's a lot of debate about this, uh, but we've asked our uh, engineers to take a look at what the cost to implement any of those proposals would be, regardless of which way the regulations came out. The number is $87 million for us to implement that. That's breaking the bank. Now, we do that in lieu of doing what? Uh, police, fire? I mean, there's only so much money in a community that's a middle class uh, community that has 69% of our kids get free and reduced school lunches. Um, so there's not a lot of money to go around. And, and these are the kinds of issues that, that we really want to get to that last mile with EPA clearly understanding that we want to walk that mile with them, but they've got to work with us as well. It can't just be a one-way street. And, and so I think that's, that's what the message is going to be. The integrated planning and the, the partnership, the teamwork approach is what we're looking for on everything, time, money, and regulation. Jim Cooper? Yes. Um and thank you because uh, I didn't get a chance and we didn't touch on integration. And I think this administration has been wonderful in removing these silos that have been set up in government in the past. And one of the key components of the pause should be looking at this integrated system. As I said, we don't have a CSO issue in Florida. However, they're all integral, all these water issues, whether you look at Chattahoochee with the watershed issue. So to take a pause and look at some of these components universally, whether it's potable water, whether it's stormwater, our stormwater infrastructure, we just saw a 60% increase in our fees just to maintain the infrastructure we require to put in. So if we really want to become integrated, you touched on all the points. I think all of them are integrated. Grants. Forgive us, but we're still going to ask for them. This is a partnership, and it's hard to define, you know, even the debate between point source or who's contributing what. So we look at the federal government as a partnership. So definitely flexibility, and we're seeing it in, in Baltimore. We're seeing it. We just haven't seen those guidelines applied throughout the national government. Permits. Not being under a consent degree, to me, I think that is one of those foolish policies. We're not, to be in a consent decree and have us spend money on legal fees, being fined, again, going back to my comments, that's not common sense approach to government because we're fining our constituents. We need to really look at that permit issue and see how they can be applied with modern technologies, with green infrastructure. And that technology has been evolving. The Clean Water Act is 40 years old, but we're seeing a broad, open, vast frontier in how we can address green infrastructure and gray infrastructure. And if we're looking at this modeling, we need to do it through the permitting process. It can't be with a hammer, and it can't be certainly fining cities that get passed on to our utility users. So we need to look at an integrated approach, and I believe that policy needs to be firmly looked at in the EPA, and I think they're starting to listen and understand that we want to continue this partnership. We have to provide solutions and be accountable as mayors. Any other mayors want to come in on this? Well, I'd like to try something. Uh, you, you said a lot of things there, and some of those related to exactly what we're saying, and I don't think some of them were. So let's try this. EPA has focused in its entire history on consent decrees. These are legal documents. They are binding, particularly if they come through the court. They are still binding if you do something administrative. They are written by lawyers in order for the lawyers to follow through with what you're responsible to do. After that, the word shall is in your life every day. You shall comply with this consent decree. You shall follow it. You shall, shall stay on the schedule, and you shall spend your money, whether you have it or not, to get it done. Time out. We need to go back and start challenging some of the things in here in a positive way. That's why I use the word enhancement with what we're doing in Omaha. The technology is 30 years old. Where's all the new technology? Where is it? 
Everybody else is using new technology, whether you're in the military, agriculture, healthcare, communications, et cetera, et cetera, fuels, et cetera, et cetera. We need to do the same thing. So the consent decrees are a huge barrier to finding new technologies, green solutions, new ways of doing it to still achieve tr clean water, but go at it with a different course and a different path. We've got to get back to the permitting so that the engineers are in the front of the room working on details with local government and the lawyers are moved from the front row to the back row. We'll get more done and it will be affordable. Thank you. Um, I'd like, I guess, to uh, comment on a couple things. First of all, integrated planning is about setting priorities. As, um, the mayor mentioned the silos are theoretically disappearing, uh, and the issue is how the various um, separate acts that ha the federal government has adopted, in fact, come together in ways that allow the local community to set priorities. Now, what does it mean to set a priority? Is it just a matter of scheduling? It is not. It's a matter of deciding what you're not going to do because other things that must be done are a higher priority. Um, and that, of course, gets defined by affordability as well as environmental necessity. Um, as long as, and, and this goes to why we continue to also ask for grant assistance, once the federal government stopped having skin in the game and all they were doing was taking money out of our pocket and telling us how to spend our money, all balance was lost. All balance was lost. So suddenly taking out every single sanitary sewer overflow was much more important than what the water quality actually was in the river. Suddenly it became a four separate CSO incidents if I was on a 30 million gallon a day stream or a 50 billion gallon a day stream. Same, same measurement stick. Doesn't make sense. So we have to have, at the end of the day, a revisit, call it a, um, a respite, um, where these issues can be looked at, where communities can in fact define integrated plans, and we're talking about all cities regardless of where they are in the consent decree process. Some cities have been hammered for years. Some of us are still in the middle of negotiating and some are still looking down the barrel of the gun. So all cities have to have the opportunity for integrated planning. We all have to have the opportunity to decide what are the priorities and we have to have a limit in the law that says it can't be any more than 2% of median household income. Thank you. Question? I'm Tom Curtis with the American Water Works Association, and Mayor Berger's last point was was my question, that the idea of a 2% cap on median household income in the law, is that 2%, uh, does that include all-in uh, costs, drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, everything? Yes. <coughs> is that, can I ask, is that a U.S. Conference of Mayors position, or is, is that a Lima, Ohio? That's, a, that's my position. The, the, the Resolution 43 talks about it in the context of CSO policy. Yes. Mark Drayton from Bloomberg News. Uh, you all have made kind of broadly many of the complaints that you hear from members of Congress and from members of industry about the Obama administration's Environmental Protection Agency. Are you criticizing this administration's uh, management of EPA in this, in this area or generally the EPA's handling of it? Let me just, if I could just, and I'd like to hear from them. Uh, officially, uh, we applaud the uh, integrated planning policy that's been initiated uh, by the Obama administration, working with the uh, EPA administrator in the White House. We've had several meetings, and I think you hear that, you hear that today. Uh, we just want it to be, we want it to move faster. And in the meantime, and in the meantime, also this complaint about the consent decrees and going the shallow. Oh yes, that's a, that's a, that that is that is happening. But uh, you asked me specifically about the Obama administration. I said in the beginning, this is didn't start with Barack Obama. 
Uh, we've been dealing with this, I think, with four presidents. Uh, as, as soon as the money went away and the mandates came, uh, and we had, we've had national campaigns working with the counties and the League of Cities and others on unfunded mandates. So it, di it did not start with uh, EPA Administrator Jackson. Uh, you know, we started with Carol Browner back in the Clinton years and through the Bush years, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, very important. And you heard every mayor say it. They were encouraged by the integrated planning policy of this administration. We just want it to happen and happen soon because we're in a recession and money is still having to be paid out. And so uh, after I've said that, I will stand by what the mayors have said and let them elaborate. Well, Chattanooga has been in this business for a long time. We worked with William Ruckel's house when he was there the first time with EPA. And we worked with every successor since then and every president who has been there since then. We, we were there before and uh, I'm pretty sure we'll be around after this present uh, administration whenever they leave office. And we will still have the same problems to deal with. No city knows the value of clean air and clean water better than Chattanooga because we've experienced it. And uh, we are not asking for a timeout on the goal of clean water. We are asking that the necessary cost be shared with all of those communities around us. Back in the 60s, we planned a regional system at the behest and with the funding of the federal government, U.S. Public Health Service. In the 1970s, well before this administration, we were cut loose and they said, you're on your own. And since that time, we have done all that has been done to clean up the Tennessee River below Chattanooga. And it's a very clean river now. You see all of the kind of activity that Mayor Berger and others have described around their communities. But we have uh, the gap that still needs to be closed, the work that still needs to be done. And we're asking for time out as far as us being the only financer of what needs to be done. We want to see the load shared by the communities that contribute to the pollution, and those are, our, those are in our region. And I don't think that's unreasonable. Bill oh, to Claire, it goes oh. back to two Bushes, a Clinton, and the President administration. But the President administration went through the recession. That's what exacerbated all this discussion and really brought it to the forefront. And I, I wanted to add, and I touched on it, I, I believe this administration has been truly working and collaborating. I think the frustration you're hearing is we have been anticipating a response of this body of work that we've been asked to the table to discuss nationally, and we're waiting for something that they produce from those products. It was committed to us in March 31st, so I think that's kind of the frustration that we have. But this administration, I've been a mayor now for almost 10 years. This administration has been one of the most open, transparent, accessible administrations and really outreaching to, again, make sure that we move forward in a partnership. And I can't agree more. You know, we're asking, it is a recession. It is a tough time. And that's why I think one of the things I could agree more with is, is the exacerbation of that John, and new fees. I, I just want to address up the, <coughs> the administration because as far as I'm concerned, uh, Barack Obama and Lisa Jackson have gotten the EPA regional administrators to the table. And we're working with them. Uh, we're trying to outline to them what our point of view is as administrators and chief executives who have to manage whatever it is that comes down no matter what system we use. But there is no criticism of the Obama administration uh, with regard to actually having EPA involved with the mayors. Uh, we're just articulating our point of view. We know that career administrators in EPA have a particular point of view as well. We think this is time for a fresh look at the entire system using new technology, innovations, and, and using real dollars in real people's pocketbooks. Um, we've almost gotten there, and we think working with the EPA we can get the final product of, of clean rivers, clean water, clean air. But uh, I, this is no slight at all on the Obama administration. And as a matter of fact, uh, since I'm the only mayor from Massachusetts, I'll be happy to take questions on Mitt Romney as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a question back here. Yeah. Yes, thank you. My name is Amina Sayed. I'm with the BNA Daily Environment Report. And 
uh, I kept hearing all of you say that you want to focus more on permits, but at the same time, you're all talking about the burdens that you're facing in complying with consent decrees. Uh, I'm, I'm talking in the context of integrated planning. So do you not want them to touch the consent decrees at all, revisit them, reopen them, incorporate that flexibility? Or uh, I, I'm sort of getting a mixed message from, from all of you, and I would appreciate not clarification. I think it's, again, underlying this whole thing is all of us are at different stages uh, with the EPA, depending on what region you're in, uh, what level of problems you have with CSOs, what other issues you may have uh, that are impacting your ability to do what EPA wants. So for some of us, we would like to reopen the existing consent decrees to take advantage of integrated planning and perhaps uh, look at longer timetables for implementation. I think others are at different stages and may use integrated planning as a way uh, to finalize their negotiations or to look uh, to the future for other negotiations that, that have yet to occur. Any other uh, responses to that question? Well, I'd like to say uh, those of us that have children, you give them a bag of uh, a blocks, and what do they do with it? They stack them up. They build something. And that's what the permitting process is. You're going in and you're taking your problems in some type of an order and saying, all right, we've got a solution here and a solution here. Now I add one more on top of it and eventually you're at clean water. The consent decree doesn't do that. The consent decree has a presumed problem, theory. We need to be dealing with facts, not theory. And it tells you where you need to be. And it tells you you're going to, you shall get there and you shall follow the plan and you shall spend the money and you st shall stay on this schedule. The permitting process is much different. You're building it together as we did in the 70s and 80s with EPA as we went from primary treatment first and then secondary treatment. We need to go back to that philosophy. Okay, with that, uh, yeah, there's a question in the back. Can you yeah. identify yourself, please? Uh, Tim Williams from the Water Environment Federation. Mayor Brewer, you uh, said earlier that Congress wasn't providing any help uh, could you comment on Senator Brown of Ohio's affordability legislation, whether you think that is a step in the right direction or whether it goes far enough? Well, I've had um, uh, a number of conversations with um, Senator Brown's staff and uh, certainly appreciate both their willingness to uh, talk with me and other mayors in Ohio. Um, we've, um, the framework of my response to his Clean Water Affordability Act is, is that it falls short of Resolution 43. Um, it leaves all discretion in the hands of the agency, uh, and it does not set metrics that are precise about limits on affordability, uh, about issues relating to their policy on CSO events, on uh, issues relating to the term over which uh, uh, goals and commitments ought to be made. Uh, in my view, uh, we have to be specific because I think where we're at now uh, simply leaves us, um, I frankly, after the election year, I'm not sure that um, most of these conversations are going to happen. Um, it's very important that we're going to get across the finish line now. I also want to comment that I really think it's an uneven circumstance among the regional offices. I think in some regional offices, um, regional administrators get it. In some regional offices, they obviously don't, both from the top all the way to the bottom. And I think headquarters has an issue. How do they get discipline uh, in their ranks to make certain that 772 cities in this country, in fact, have the opportunity of integrated planning? And until they truly demonstrate that that can happen, we're not there. Thank you. Thank you. One last question. Uh, yeah, Joe Morton with the World Herald. There's a lot of talk about um, kind of mixed on whether the EPA, uh, I know some of you have had good working relationships with them, but there's also talk about how heavy-handed dictatorial. What What is the prospect for actual change here? Like what leverage do you guys have either with EPA or with Congress since you were saying you can't even get a, a meeting with the speaker? Uh, what exactly, what leverage do you guys have to actually get some progress on this? Because this is something you've been talking about for a while, obviously. 
Well, we, we believe, I, I think I can say, and I think they've said before, we are making progress. We do have an administration with an EPA administrator that's a friend of the city's, and uh, she is doing everything she can uh, to bring uh, us to the table. Um, and we will all be working very hard on integrated planning. Uh, but after, after we have said that, uh, there are still challenges. So um, uh, right now, well, we're playing, uh, I believe right now, we're working inside with the administration, with EPA, to solve these issues. That's where we are right now. Uh, every now and then, we are, we are being called by members of Congress and of course, we will be assembling for the 80th Annual Conference of Mayors in Orlando, Florida on June 13th. And these issues are still in front of us as we have the resolutions that the two mayors have put forth. We have our Water Council, we have the Environmental Committee, we have the body of mayors that will come from all over the nation. So uh, I think we're in the spirit right now of saying, hey, time out. At the same time, let's continue to work with the integrated uh, policy that we asked for and has been given to us. Uh, still there are challenges, but uh, that's, I think that's the best answer we can give you. And so with that, I would like to thank all the mayors for being here and participating in this event, the 40th anniversary of the Clean Water Act.